ว่าจะทำให้ปาร์ตี้ว่าแกงสุมาสุกนะแกงโซ่ชันแตงโอแกงชื่อหรือเปล่าแกงก็พี่ตำรวจพวกแกงพี่ตำรวจชิมเลยพอเราโตก็ลำไส้ปลาเราจับมั่งเลยเรื่องแบบแกงชาติที่สังเกตยอดยิ่งแต่ต้องมีแบบมาเสียสิ้นเลยแกงปลาเราโง่เลยพอทำแบบปุ๊บเรียบเรียบเรื่องไหนแกงแบบเออพวกแกงไงก็ทำแบบมีแบบของอาร์มีดูดูดูได้เลยที่ตัวแกดีแกงCulture events, what we call them. Um, it's engaging with youth like ourselves and featuring different ethnic persons to talk about their culture, what it was like growing up in a diaspora community or just a country that was outside of Burma. 
and just sharing, like, you know, the experiences. It was really interesting. I remember, like, the first few, um, we had a very big global event. People from all over came in, from the diaspora, and it was amazing to see. Like, we saw people coming from Europe, you know, from America, from all kinds of places. And they were really fascinated to hear from one another, you know, especially when we had these featured speakers talking about what it was like growing up in this place or that place, you know. And especially just sharing about their own cultural identity because Myanmar is such a diverse country. Um, we have over 135 ethnic groups that are not, and 135 is the only documented version. Keep that in mind. Like there's so many more that we don't even know about. I don't even know about myself. So just being able to educate one another about this, um, you know, differences, these, um, the, the beauty and diversity of our country really, you know, it's I think something that's really essential, you know, for all of us to just take in so that we can further, you know, enhance this identity, cultural identity uh, for our personal individual level and then community level. And then with the feminine question, um, I would say uh, this is more so an issue with the older generation. No, 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 no shade. But like with our, uh, you know, younger people, I don't think there's much of a disparity, which I'm really glad to say. You know, we all see each other as equals. Um, I know back then, a few generations back, maybe even our own parents' generation, there's so much of that disparity where like women are looked down upon so much, like they don't contribute as much to the table or whatever. But you know, I see, I see so much strength in our girls over here. Like. We're really, you know, picking it up, and I, I, and you know, we do have some guys too that are maybe in the background supporting us. Like I, mean, I have guys in our team, you know, <laughs> but um, that's not to diminish anyone. Um, it, we just happen to be girls here. That I think that's just the answer. So why do you think it's the older generation that's not supporting? Uh, supporting women or? No, what, what you guys are talking about is about looking at the older generations, right? Yeah, like oh, how are they not being supportive of them? Oh, they have more about that gender divide. Well, I mean, you know, if you look at um, the history of Burma, it's very steeped in tradition. Um, there's just a lot of misogyny. It, it's just the way the culture has been. You have to understand Burma inside and out to really get the sense of the misogyny there um, and the patriarchy. You know, like uh, maybe we have some of it here in America too, but it's really the states could do uh, there, but it was the most searing experience certainly in my life um, to be living in Sarajevo. You know, a place where one in every two or three marriages was mixed, in fact, um, or more. Um, and then just to see people pulverized strictly on the basis of their religion, insofar as ethnicity as well coincided with religion. If you're calling it Catholic, a Serb, Orthodox, Bosniak, Muslim, and to see the mosques, you know, just getting obliterated, and then in other parts of the country, to see the Catholic churches firebombed uh, from within. I mean, it was the such an awakening uh, for, for a young person. And this was at a time when the Berlin Wall had fallen, the Soviet Union had collapsed. It looked like uh, you know, the end of history might be, might be near uh, to some, but here, uh, you know, as societies were redefining themselves, fissures that had existed and never been broached, never mind healed, were exploited uh, by people who spoke in the name of religion and ethnicity, but but you know uh, exhibited uh, you know no love of mankind, uh, exhibited no testament to that faith in, in their actions. So you know my own view and, and how I carry that forward uh, is to just understand the stakes of the work we do, the stakes of the diplomacy we do um, uh, in order to prevent. Religious tension from uh, widening into full blown conflict. The recognition that in places where you see freedom of religion muzzled or restricted, the studies show you know that correlates with a much greater propensity uh, for violence, for social conflict in the first instance, and for violence. So you know we live in a world right now more conflict than at any time since the end of the Cold War. I think that has snuck up on people, just how many conflicts are, are out there. Of course, the, the front page uh, conflict of, of this invasion of Ukraine. Um, but, you know, again, in low key ways, sometimes low key insurgencies, often with religious targeting as a feature of that. So, if we can work upstream together, you know, through the kind of interfaith dialogue we do, 
or in contesting restrictions on religion or in bringing communities together or in USAID's case, one of the most incredible things we are fortunate to do uh, in addition to having programming that supports religious freedom is to be able to call on religious leaders to exercise that freedom on behalf of broader development and humanitarian challenges. And so the other sort of bookend to my Bosnia experience, uh, which was so powerful and got me motivated to try to pursue a, a, you know, a career in, in, in public service ultimately and, and, and to be able to do something about these challenges. Um, but the other thing I would point back to is something that we worked on together in the Obama years, which is Central African Republic. You know, seeing religious leaders step forward at great risk, personal risk to themselves, to use their voices to try to shelter uh, people who were being targeted uh, by, again, extremists uh, pretending to act in the name of, of, of faith. The Ebola crisis, where it was religious leaders, because they were able to exercise again that freedom of religion, were able to be out there teaching safe burials. We see it today in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and recently in Uganda, uh, where we were able to curb an Ebola epidemic that could have gotten wildly out of hand in large measure because those religious leaders had the pulpit, uh, because they had the trust of their communities, and because we had built those connections over time and were able to, to channel our resources uh, through them. And then the last example I give in my current job, which is, again, not religious freedom as such, it's religious engagement to produce greater human rights outcomes more broadly, but by having religious freedom, uh, these are the kinds of benefits that can be accrued, and that's in the global vaccination plan on COVID. I mean, you know, the world has moved on, sought to move on from COVID for very understandable reasons, but lo and behold, the last many, many checked, Africa, you know, most African countries were, you know, under 10% in terms of vaccination rates. In, in just six months, Tanzania has gone recently from June of last year to now from about a 12% vaccination rate to about the 85% vaccination rate because of EMOMAS, church leaders, and others working together, uh, you know, to push the message and, and to try to promote the safety of their, of their communities. That can't happen. international community, in the international world, about actually accepting and understanding that youth aren't the problem. Youth are actually organizing solutions, actually at the forefront of the social norms changes that we need to have in order to build progress, and we need to harness them. That norms change has led to us having standing room only in a, in a meeting like this. So, in that work, I personally, I, you know, I'm not a, a, an expert or, or have a lot of knowledge on, on the movement of religious freedom and of the work, but I can imagine a moment like that in a month with youth leaders actually setting the agenda, speaking actually out about what they envision for the next generation of, of freedom, a uh, vision for society, and actually organizing themselves. I can imagine that. Uh, along our way, you know, and just to say, there are a couple of things within that that I've understood from my colleagues. First, the youth, this generation of young people is the largest generation in human history. 40% of those the people living in conflict areas around the world who are suffering from intensive violence and repression are youth. And in, a, in the category of 18 to 25, it's a huge cohort of people. That's a lot of potential power and an excellent influence. And yet, and 85% of youth around the world identify in some form or another as religious. What a, I have